When we define marketing research, it's probably useful to separate these into two separate ideas. Mind you, there's a lot of different definitions of marketing research. I, enc I encourage you to go Google a few different definitions provided by our, uh, different sources. First, one common definition of marketing, and one that I like because it's rather short, says that ma marketing is about managing profitable customer relationships. In other words, every single activity that we do in marketing, every strategy that we consider, every tactic that we engage in, all serves this greater purpose how we manage the lifetime relationship of a customer and do so in a way that is profitable to us, or in the case of a nonprofit, aligns with our objectives. Research, whether it's about marketing, finance, biology, or physics, is a systemat systematic inquiry to establish facts in an objective manner. The word systematic is very important. That means we must have a process when we conduct our research. Establishing facts. We're trying to determine what is or is not true and real. When we do this, we do this in an objective manner. By objective, I like to think of this uh, as being as impartial as possible. That is, a good researcher is completely indifferent to the conclusions that their research provides. Instead, the researcher is satisfied that the process itself led to an honest, objective answer. So this, con this converges on a common definition of marketing research. Marketing research provides managers timely, accurate, objective information and insight about current and potential customers. Our big assumption is that if we provide marketing managers timely, accurate, objective information, they'll be able to make the right decisions and take the right actions, and that'll tend to make their organization succeed. It's worth keeping in mind that this is not the only mechanism that can be used to inform decision making. Think about some bosses that you've had in jobs in the past. You may have noticed that some of the common ways that they went about making decisions were some of these techniques below. Just simply guessing, using their intuition, monkey see, monkey do, or imitation. Just look at what your competitor or someone else who's successful is doing and just imitate them under the presumption that it must work well for you as well. Or you might just simply get lucky. And there's a bunch of other techniques for making decisions like these. Now, in this class, we're clearly going to be rely relying on the top approach there. But I don't mean to completely dismiss these other approaches. Every single one of these other approaches has something going for it. That is, they will tend to take less time, less money, and less effort than a marketing research-based approach. Based on the previous definition, it should be apparent that marketing research can be used for anything that might confront a marketer. However, it can be useful to organize some of these marketing research applications in systematic ways. One way to organize marketing research is to consider the four primary pursuits, that is, the types of problems that marketing research often tries to solve. First, identifying market opportunities and problems. Two, generating, refining, and evaluating potential marketing actions. Three, monitoring marketing performance. And then fourth, improving marketing as a process in of itself. Consider this study from the medical field. In this study, 180 patients who were 60 or over and had long-term medical issues were asked to evaluate the health stakes of specific physical or cognitive disabilities. Specifically, for these different hypothetical cognitive or physical disabilities, the respondent was asked to evaluate whether they thought having this issue would be better or worse than death. But the results here are interesting. If you look on the far left-hand side, you'll see that over 50% of the respondents said that bowel and bladder incontinence would be worse than death, whereas being bound in a wheelchair or having moderate pain all the time or having to stay at home all day was typically rated much or somewhat better than death. Now, this research is clearly not specific to a specific marketing issue, however, at this stage in the marketing process, it could be useful for idea generation. Other medical research has shown that older adults tend to not report that they're dealing with bowel or bladder incontinence, and instead they just accept it as a normal part of aging. For a marketer, this could be an opportunity for service improvement. In other words, improving the bedside manner of doctors and nurses, encouraging situations where older adults are capable of expressing these types of issues that they're dealing with so that they get the care they need. Or, as another idea, this type of research could inspire product innovation. There's already some medications out there that treat different types of overactive bladders. Perhaps this type of research indicates that there could be a market for more of these types of products as this type of uh, debilitating issue 
is considered extremely negative by older adults. Another common pursuit of marketing research is to generate, refine, and evaluate potential marketing actions. In this situation, we already have a set of possibilities that we're willing to consider doing in terms of marketing, maybe a set of different strategies or def a couple different tactical options. Here, we're going to use marketing research to help us figure out which of those choices is likely to be the most productive. Just one example of this would be using a research technique called conjoint analysis to find out how consumers are willing to make trade-offs between the price and product features. I'm going to give you the world's lightest introduction to a conjoint analysis style experiment. We'll do that by playing a little would you rather game. Imagine you or someone that you care about is in the market for an electric bike. Which of the following three options would you prefer? In all cases, every other feature about the bike is exactly the same amongst the three, except for the ones that you see below. Would you prefer the one in the middle that has the longest lasting motor but costs the most money? Or would you prefer the one on the right that has the cheapest price but it also has a very short warranty? Or maybe you prefer the one on the left that has a bit of a middle ground of all the options. A marketer confronted with figuring out how to mix the product features in the best way that still satisfies the need of the customer at a price that they will pay and meets our profit needs is the goal of a conjoint analysis. So, like many other marketing research techniques, conjoint analysis reduces the need to rely on assumptions in our marketing strategy. Remember, assumptions are just things that we presume to be true despite us not having explicit empirical evidence that supports it. In marketing, we always have to have some assumptions. Some things will never be known for certain and we can't conduct research about everything. But for those high stakes assumptions, those things that if we're wrong could have cataclysmic results, marketing research is often valuable. Another common pursuit of marketing research is to actually monitor your marketing performance. In other words, once decisions have been made, you track to see how you perform so that you can learn and improve in real time or take evaluative actions at a later time to make better choices in the future. Let's give an example. An interesting article called What Makes a Television Commercial Sell Using Biometrics to Identify Successful Ads came from the Journal of Advertising Research in 2017. In this study, they wanted to determine if biometric tracking of consumers' responses to television commercials, specifically mostly candy bar commercials, helped explain which TV ads over and underperformed in terms of driving sales in regional markets. So what they did was they took 118 different advertisements from 20 different brands and then took a variety of biometric measures in laboratory of consumers. So biometric measures include things like facial tracking, looking for smiling, laughing, anger, eye tracking, seeing where their eyes moved while they were looking at the commercial, uh, heart monitoring, and so on. Then a third party company that already tracks ad effectiveness in the real world, uh, they have data on the estimated effect of these commercials in the real world in terms of driving sales in different markets. So they took the biometric data rating each one of the ads, and they match that up with third-party data that already indicated whether or not an ad over or underperformed. The idea was maybe the biometric measures teach us and give us some indication about what type of advertisements tend to succeed and which ones tend to underperform. In this study, they found a few interesting things. First, at least in the case of these candy bar ads, biometric readings that indicated an ad was perceived as funny improves the chances of being a successful ad. On the other hand, when the biometric trackers indicated that someone was not paying particularly close attention to an ad over time, this actually increased the chances that it would be an ad that would fail. While some of these results may seem intuitive, what's important here is that these results showed that actual biometric feedback, not just how people evaluated ads as being funny or boring, actually taught us a little more about how whether or not an ad would succeed. If you look at this chart here in the bottom right hand side, it indicates one of the findings. Notice on the, on the x-axis, running horizontally, we see 30 seconds, in other words, the spot for a 30 second ad. The dotted line represents poor ads, those ads that underperformed at driving sales in the marketplace. The thick black line indicated the three other type of ads, those that performed on average or in a superior manner. Those were the ones coded as a four. On the y-axis, we see that we actually have heart rate monitoring changes from baseline. So over time, take someone's given heart rate and see how it changes or alters as they move across an ad. What we see here is that poor ads, people's heart rates tended to actually decrease as a uh, as it changed across the baseline compared to the other ads where it stayed a little closer to baseline and then peaked towards the end. This is an example of how biometric reading helped indicate exactly how someone was behaviorally responding to an ad and might indicate whether or not it is financially successful. Finally, 
The fourth prim primary pursuit of marketing research is to improve marketing as a process overall. If we understand and accept that marketing is actually a process, it's not just an art, the idea is that marketing research, when integrating these first three primary pursuits, can help us improve our ability to conduct marketing research in a rigorous fashion.